the Radio Forest Podcast. Hey, this is John Early. Quick question. Did you just see Madonna live? Oh my, how did you know? John, I know. I do a little bit of research. <laughs> I saw her live in Los Angeles. I paid so much money for floor seats. And then, of course, the day of, they were available for like $100. Did you have good seats, though? Or did you kind of like whatever you could get then? Honestly, I got really good seats. It was my friend's 40th birthday, and we... Whenever we cook together, we put on the Immaculate Collection and sing at the top of our lungs. So it was very important that we have good seats. And she really, it was shocking. It was such an amazing tour. How does it differ from Britney Spears Live? It's got, is it similar or no? (laughs) Well, you know, here's the thing that I realized watching Madonna. Like, Madonna isn't for kids. You know, and like you re- you realize when you see her and she's doing all this very provocative stuff and like there's all this crazy like Catholic like fetish imagery and it's really like sexy. But you're like, oh, pop stars today are like for kids. They're all for like teeny boppers, you know, and she really is like she's for everyone. I don't know. She's the best. Yeah, I guess she's a little bit more p- a punk rock in a way, isn't she? Exactly, exactly. And it genuinely felt, even after all these years, it did feel like kind of wild and subversive. It was so cool. We're talking to John Early. His Now More Than Ever album is coming out September 13th. John, how does this differ than the one from Max? So that's that's video, right? And then this is audio, but then it's like some expanded concepts. Can you explain that to me a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so in the in my HBO special, we do these like song covers and kind of like a Bette Midler, Sandra Bernhardt kind of psychedelic cabaret thing. But in the album version, we added four other cover songs that we recorded in a studio. We got my dad and his best friend on the trumpet. <laughs> um, my dad came out of trumpet retirement from playing at weddings to playing Madonna on my album. You know, and then there's also a special set that we had to cut from the special from this comedian Vicky with a V, who happens to be um, my alter ego, my my kind of Southern Christian stand-up mom character. Does that have a little bit of, of a Britney vibe in it, or is that just me, uh, the, Vicky with a V? Oh yeah, there's that, Vicky. No, Vicky with a V is a little more. She's a little more country. She's a little kind of, uh, she's like a wine mom. But we do cover Britney. There is a Britney cover. So your dad then came out of trumpet retirement. And I know you've been asked this before, <laughs> but how did they know some of this, the, um, the jokes in the special before they were there? Were they like already familiar with your act? Or did you save it to like, they, no, I want your real surprise in this? Well, yeah. So like I basically in this in the show, I put like I focused this like shaft of white light on their teeth and I kind of torture them throughout the show and make them listen to some of my racier material. But they they had not seen those particular jokes, but they have been to my shows before. So for some reason are such good sports and they really get a kick out of it, I think, because the audience really freaks out when they when I announce that they're there and I you know it's very sweet so they they somehow put up with it even though I'm talking about anal I'm talking about anal (laughs) (laughs) yeah both your parents were ministers I'm sure that's not a common topic that they've dealt with and then it's their their own son do a sermon on anal so were they always very open-minded or did you sort of expose them to being different people. I would assume two ministers like, look, this isn't good for your salvation. We're worried about you. But they're at your show. So at some point they're like, you know what? It's, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I lucked out. They're kind of, they're the strain of Presbyterianism, <laughs> not to associate uh, religion with a disease, but they, they are, um, they're a strain of Presbyterianism that is very like kind of groovy and accepting and and, uh, you know, they met in divinity school, so they're kind of like theology nerds. Like, they were really, they were always just somehow very cool with letting me kind of go off on my own and watch whatever I wanted to watch. And, you know, thanks to them, it's like I was able, because they let me watch all this crazy stuff, it's like that's how I found, like, Margaret Cho and Cat Williams, <laughs> crazy comedians that I think most parents would be worried about me seeing. But that's how I got into it all. Now, I wanted to ask you about a couple of projects you've done that have had some pretty big name profiles attached to them. The first being, is there any chance you saw or worked with Keanu Reeves through doing some voices for the DC League of Super Pets? Sadly, no, I didn't meet him that because, you know, that was during COVID. And so I was like, 
that I, I recorded my part in that in a, in a tiny closet. It was my big return back into the closet. <laughs> now, yeah. um, so I didn't get to meet Keanu, but he is like a true hero of mine. I think so many of my favorite actors are just women. And Keanu is like the first kind of male actor. I was like, oh, he's a god. He's yeah. like so special. So how long did it take you to record voice parts for like that? Is it just days on end of you just reading? And are, are you watching footage at the same time or just reading a script? Well, usually they just do it. that You don't watch it with footage. So they just kind of get your natural voice first. You're not like syncing it to anything. But you know what's so amazing about the animation people is they really just like it to be kind of thrown away they like it to sound like you they don't like i'm a perfectionist i'm always like can i please do it again and they they really just kind of let you they do it really fast but i think they like you to be kind of just throwing it out there not too controlled you know is that your experience also then with like bob's burgers rick and morty robot chicken american dad or they yeah. all kind of all run the same way they're all very relaxed you do like three takes and then they move on i'm like really but then I think because of that, it sounds all like just a little more natural and easy. So when you did Drunk History, any chance you got to hang out or talk to Tony Hale? Because his his parts in that are just hilarious with your voiceovers. I know. I know. But I assume maybe I they're shot at different I times. Later, shot at different times. The drunk part that you they just do, you know, away from the rest of it. But I got to meet him later, thank God. But um, he's a he's a genius. <laughs> It was so good. How drunk do you get? And were you really drinking? They showed wine, right? And I think it's truly done. Like you do have some drinks, right? It's authentic, I guess. No, you actually drink. I had martinis. I chose gin martinis, which is so stupid. I mean, I, I have a sip of gin and I'm like red in the face and just complete (laughs) and I'm like weeping. You know, (laughs) I don't know why I chose that, but I I genuinely had three martinis. They give you charcoal pills so that it's like less of a hangover. What's a charcoal pill? Is that supposed to help? It's I don't know. It's like a purifying it's like truly like a black charcoal like pill. Mm. I don't know. But it didn't work. I'll tell you that much. (laughs) I was so hungover. So so hungover. Now, how did you start working with Tim Heidecker? And the reason why I ask this is, uh, I don't know word this correctly. He can be very, not critical. I don't want to paint him in a way that he's not. He enjoys <laughs> you. And I think that's a high watermark, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Well, I, I, we were on the show called Killing It on Peacock. That is no longer with us. We did the show in New Orleans together and we had dinner a bunch and He's just like, he really created a whole genre that like all my peers kind of benefited from, you know, mm-hmm. like this kind of alternative comedy, kind of artsy comedy thing. And I, he's just a God and he's such a good guy. And we've, I don't know for, and also we like both have a kind of musical element to what we do. And so he got me into, and I know this will sound <laughs> insane that I hadn't gotten into them previously because they're like Coca-Cola essentially, but he got me into the Beatles. <laughs> well, I think I think for people of like our age, you grow up hearing so much about the Beatles. You're like, yeah, 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 whatever. And you're not hearing yeah. constant stuff. So then when you go back, I'm a late person to the game of the Beatles as well. I was like, yeah, okay, probably not to my better. late 30s or even 40s. Then one day I was like, oh my God, this is really good. It just took so a I while. Was sh- I was like talking to my friends. I was like, you guys, it's really good. They're like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Everyone knows it's good. Yeah. I was like talking, I was like calling my parents, freaking out. They're like, yeah, that's real. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like someone tells you, you got to see this movie. It's so awesome. You're like, I don't want to see that movie. Your, your opinion sucks yeah. or it's too built up. Yeah. So with your musical history, tell me about John Early and the Lemon Squares. And they're part of, right, you kind of open up the Now More Than Ever album coming out in September, right? Yes, yes. There um, the, there's these like guys that have been playing with me since like 2013. They, they all are like these just incredible musicians that normally play in these kind of like indie rock kind of blues like worlds that I'm so not a part of. And so I think they get a real kick out of like playing Britney and Madonna and Donna Summer and <laughs> um, but we do, you know, in the special on the album, we do like we do Britney, but we also do like Neil Young, you know, so they, they also get to do their kind of sweet spot, too. But um, they're just really they are so they're really into the music part of it. But I think they also it's a nice break for them. They get to just kind of sit on stage and laugh. And I, of course, you know, like to kind of harass them on stage. And they're they're very they play along. They're very great. You do seem to have a little bit of a classic rock influence. I've noticed that. So we mentioned the Beatles. 
You brought up Neil Young. I think you guys have done some Bowie too, right? Is that 70s arena rock a little bit imprinted on you? Or you guys just kind of dip into that? Or or how does that come about? I think it it was like a virtue of doing the special, you know, like we, it was when I do my live shows, it's like, it's very sacred to me. It feels like, I mean, you'll, you can hear the the religious line and all the words, but, but, um, but like, it feels to me like a tent revival because it gets so wild and sweaty. And like, I really, I was really scared to film it because I thought it would just not feel as wild as it feels in real life. So the only, we realized that kind of the only way to capture the liveness was to take a kind of gritty 70s rock doc, kind of gimme shelter, last waltz kind of approach. And I think that's where the, that's where the rock influence really kind of calcified. I think it's cool because, you know, I'm a gay guy and like (laughs) people expect me to be doing something maybe a little more polished and it's I think it's fun to switch it up and, and go in a rock direction. So we've talked about Madonna, we've talked about Britney, but you're also you are in the Taylor Swift universe, right? <laughs> I, I actually am. I'm in the Taylor Swift extended universe and it's the only thing my nieces care about that I've done. <laughs> but yeah, I was in her music video Anti Hero, which is such a goddamn good song. That was just the thrill of a lifetime. Do your nieces then tell you to like send her a message or can she come to my birthday party or do you, can you get me an autograph? Yeah, exactly. They don't quite understand like the scale of it. Like they, they think it's, yeah, it's like, well, I'm in the video with her, so I must know her and they must have a direct line to her. They really don't understand how exactly what the kind of various strata of, of status is in the world quite yet. <laughs> Filming for the now more than ever. Where did you do that? We did it at Roulette in, um, it's, it's in downtown Brooklyn. And that was always my favorite place to perform was in Brooklyn, you know, in my twenties and stuff. And I have a real like kind of faithful audience there, but that's, that's where we did it. So my impression when I hear Brooklyn, I think a lot more of like a rough crowd does not give you any chances, but you said that's like your favorite, that's your favorite venue, but you're kind of a New York guy then, right? So you just kind of build your audience through there or you just popped in and, and then loved it? Well, that's, you know, that's just where all my, like, you know, when I was in my 20s, that's when no one could afford living in Manhattan. So everyone my age lived in Brooklyn. And so, you know, the people that were coming to my shows were kind of from my world and uh, and they and they really dug it, you know. So it wasn't that hard to win over the Brooklyn audience. It becomes harder, actually, as they become cooler and smarter and I become older and dorkier. <laughs> is it is it still the same vibe then or has it changed like you're saying there it's kind of a different sort of Brooklyn than quote unquote you grew up with? You know, I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, kind of with everything, it's like the internet. It's like people are now consuming comedy in a different way and people consume it in these short little clips on like Instagram and TikTok, which wasn't the case when I was starting out. And so I do notice there's a difference where I'm like, I'm up there doing these really long shows with like full length songs and it's very kind of like groovy and long and like, and I've noticed sometimes like, oh, the the kind of tension span. I also think in a positive sense, people really like that it's like longer and, you know, and we work really hard. We really take care of it. We really put on a a proper show, you know. So it feels maybe more substantial than just like a TikTok. It's actor, comedian, and musician John Early. The band is John Early in the Lemon Squares. It's in the Now More Than Ever album, the audio album coming out September 13th. John, I want to say thank you for calling in today and chatting with me. I appreciate it, man. I really appreciate you having me. Everyone get the album. I just realized it comes out on Friday the 13th. Terrified. (laughs) All right, John. We'll see you. All right. Thank you.